article leads to a PDF copy of what I'm going to talk about today. So if you'd like to. Also, I'm going to put this up at the end as well. So uh, if you miss it, don't worry. Uh, so thank you for coming. My name is Howard Brown. And uh, as you heard, I'm from the University of New York Prefecture. Uh, I'm going to start with some good news. I might be able to finish a little early today, because a lot of what I wanted to talk about, you just heard. <laughs> Uh, so I think you're primed and ready to go. Um, I've been studying um, EMI uh, implementation and the implementation of EMI as an international program. Uh, I've been looking at this for going back about six years, I think. I, I started getting actively involved in it. Um, in my title, I say EMI and international programs because in a lot of the programs that I've studied, those two ideas are very much conflated. And the idea that an international program must have EMI in it. And the idea that if a program has EMI in it, ipso facto, it is international. Uh, that conflation is very common in Japan. So um, I personally don't think that these are synonymous terms, but they are used synonymously in many contexts here in Japan. Um, so the title of my talk today is Factors for Success in EMI <coughs> and International Programs. And in particular, for the past six years, I've been looking at EMI programs that are in the majority here in Japan, EMI as part of a mainstream Japanese medium instruction program. So these are programs where students take 10%, 20% of their credits in EMI, but most of their classes are taught. Also, I've been looking at programs that are primarily focused on domestic students because those are the majority of programs here in Japan. So everything I talk about today, uh, I'm specifically not talking about English taught programs where the whole degree is in English, and I'm mostly talking about programs for uh, domestic students and mainly taught by domestic faculty as well. Uh, and rather than report on the findings of, of any given research project that I've done, um, I'm sort of looking back over the course of six years and sort of putting together uh, my impressions of what is leading some EMI programs to be more successful and giving students a better experience and some EMI programs that are struggling. Okay. Um, so what do we need for success? And I've, I've identified these factors in two groups. Uh, one is that there are a number of factors that are unique to these international programs, these EMI programs. Uh, but also, honestly, most of what makes an EMI program work is deeper and more fundamental. And before you can start to have success as an EMI program, you need to build a program that can work as a program. Um, and that's a, something that I think we're not paying enough attention to. I know myself, six years ago when I started, I was very much focused on what makes the EMI program special. And over the past few years, I've started to shift my attention more and more to these deeper issues, these questions of what makes a program run as a program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the EMI-specific factors, and then I'm going to look at these sort of deeper, more fundamental issues. Uh, the EMI-specific factors that I've identified, uh, actually I have a list of about 20, uh, but I want to just focus on the big points for today. Um, language support and related to that language benchmarks, a question of bridging the student's transition from EFL to EMI, materials is a huge problem for many programs, and quality of teaching is especially important for EMI. Um, in terms of language support, this is especially important for the Japanese EMI programs that serve mainly domestic students in a part-time EMI program. Um, we don't have any good data on the relationship between language proficiency and academic success here in Japan. But if we apply the data that we have coming from Europe or from some replication studies done in the Middle East, um, CEPHR B2 is a fairly good threshold for EMI success. Up to CEPHR B1, there's a very strong correlation between the student's language proficiency and their academic outcome. But when you hit B2, variations between students in terms of language proficiency is only a minor factor in their academic outcomes. But I'm sure, as a lot of us here know, working in Japan, there are very few incoming undergraduate students that are at that level and are ready to take on the challenge of EMI. 
So two options. One, just admit that EMI is only for elite stream of students and you're only going to get seven of them on your campus. Or implement a semi-intensive EAP program before and ideally before and during the EMI classes. Um, good news is more universities are starting to do this. These are becoming more common as more and more universities are acknowledging the reality of what's going on there. Um, the sink or swim approach that was almost universal when I started looking at EMI six years ago is now, it's still distressingly common, but people are starting to realize sink or swim is not an effective option. And so there, the universities that implement EMI in the first wave um, have gone back and they've started to add intensive EAP to their programs. And universities that are now implementing EMI for the first time, they're starting with an EAP program attached. <coughs> um, so it's not universal yet, but this is getting better at many campuses. Um, related to this idea is the notion of language benchmarks. Um, if we know that Cepher B2 is what you need, well, set a benchmark and enforce it. You can't join the EMI class until you have this. Um, on the good side, this sends a realistic message to students about what they need to do. Um, it's somewhat better for student motivation in some contexts, and it definitely avoids faculty frustration, because the faculty members who are teaching EMI classes are very frustrated at the linguistic issues their students face. However, it will definitely hinder recruitment, um, and it may even stop some students from even thinking about joining when they see this number that they have to somehow reach. Um, there's also a problem of it creating a wall rather than a hurdle. Okay? Um, that you end up with students who are constantly trying to cross the hurdle, and they just can't get it. Um, there are also lots of logistical issues associated with this. Who's going to pay for the tests? Which test do you choose? Which specific number do you pick as a benchmark? Um, I've seen programs. <coughs> both succeed and fail with and without benchmarks. Um, so this is a bit of an open issue, whether or not the benchmarks are really necessary. But one thing that's not an open issue, it's definitely necessary, is some kind of bridge. The jump from EFL to EMI for domestic students is huge. It's a very, very big challenge for domestic students coming out of a regular high school English program and going into a university where they're going to take up to, for example, a quarter of their credits taught in English. It's not just a linguistics challenge. It's a challenge of an approach to how they study. It's a psychological challenge. It's a social challenge. It's a cultural challenge. It's a huge issue. Um, and for a long time, many universities avoided this issue altogether. This was another area where the sink or swim approach was uh, very, very common. It's getting better that there are more universities who acknowledge that this challenge is important, and they place something in the middle as some kind of bridging program. Um, sometimes they support this transition with very intensive EAP programs, which is you know, better than nothing. Um, there's an option for CLIL, um, where language teachers can teach a sheltered approach to EMI in a, in a CLIL classroom, and sort of get the students ready for the next step. Um, or there's the approach of team teaching, uh, which is actually what my university does. I'm now I'm team teaching a class with a political scientist on introduction to international relations. His role is content focused, and my role is on supporting this transition, supporting it linguistically and with the academic skills that they need. Um, another big thing that I think is a key factor to success is materials. Appropriate materials for EMI, it's very challenging to find good materials to use in EMI classes. Um, we think, oh, these classes are taught in English, I'll just get a book from America or from Britain or from Australia. But the imported materials are inappropriate in so many ways. Um, number one is just the length, because many of these books are written for year-long classes that meet three, day, three times a week. And Japanese university classes are 90 minutes a week for 15 weeks. So just the breadth and depth of the coverage is inappropriate. Often the writing style is not great. And uh, the cultural assumptions are also often problematic. 
I've had lots of issues where students come to me when I've used these materials and say, I don't understand this sentence. And the problem has not been a question of their understanding of the language. It's been, OK, this is what this thing is. OK. <laughs> um, it's been that this writer has written based on a certain set of cultural assumptions about what his readers do and don't understand. Um, these are all, these make, these all work together to make a lot of imported materials inappropriate, especially inappropriate for intro level classes. And this is sort of a, an interesting feature of EMI in Japan, that many, many, many um, EMI classes are intro level classes. Um, I don't have good numbers on this, but anecdotally, I would even go so far as to say the majority of EMI classes are intro level classes. And this happens because a lot of EMI programs are put together a bit ad hoc, as we've heard in the two earlier presentations. And a university that has, let's say, seven departments, maybe one or two faculty members from each department will teach in EMI. And they will all teach introduction to their specialty. And those classes get bundled together as an EMI program, even though they have nothing to do with each other. And so the student's experience in EMI ends up being a series of introduction to X classes. And introduction to X class materials imported from, especially from the West, tend to be very inappropriate for the Japanese audience. Um, Finding, an appro finding appropriate materials is possible, but difficult. Uh, I think the best solution really is uh, creating in-house materials. Um, and I wish that there were publishing companies in Japan who were willing to go the extra mile and create a series of EMI textbooks. I've written two so far. If anyone out there is a publisher, <laughs> Introduction to International Relations, The History of Japan's International Relations, I've got them ready to go. Um, Another issue that I think is specific to EMI is quality of teaching. And I, quality of teaching is important for everyone, but I put this in the specific for EMI category because if you experience bad teaching in your first language, you can work around it. When I was an undergraduate student, I had some bad teachers, but I still learned what I needed to learn. But if you experience bad teaching in your second language, it adds a whole new layer of difficulty. And a lot of students, especially the domestic students who are already struggling with the transition to EMI, they don't have the capacity to overcome this issue. Um, so bad teaching is especially difficult for EMI students. Um, faculty development is a possibility. And in fact, I've been very pleased to see a lot of development in FD programs at universities in Japan specifically targeting EMI teachers. Um, some universities are sending their EMI faculty overseas for special programs. They're bringing in um, expert lecturers to talk during FD sessions about EMI. They're running language programs for EMI students. It's all getting better and better and better. However, and I think we've all experienced this, the people that you most want to participate in the FD programs are the ones who don't go. Um, so the overall level of teaching often does not improve as a result of FD, because the people who participate in FD events are already good teachers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the key to success here is good hiring decisions from the outset. That's really where you need to focus your attention. Okay. So um, those are the factors that I think are sort of specific to EM. <coughs> And, or at least especially important for the EMI aspect of things. But there's a whole other set of factors that I think are important at a more fundamental level. They're important before you even start to think about the EMI factors. And these are communication and coordination, long-term planning, shared vision, integration, and HR issues. Um, communication and coordination um, in any program at any university, when you have lack of communication, you get lack of buy-in. And you end up, especially if you lack communication in early planning, you end up with faculty members feeling like this program has been imposed on us. It's been helicoptered in, and the administration has said, here, here's your EMI program. Go make it work. Or as you said, people are just told, start an ETP next year. And without that communication, it's difficult. 
and a lack of communication and coordination. I don't say it causes factionalism and rivalries, but I think it brings factionalism and rivalries that were already existing, it brings those to the front if there's not good communication. But with good communication, long-term planning is possible. If you have good communication, it's possible to have a shared vision, to have a sense of direction, to understand where you're going with this program, uh, which is actually my next point, the idea of long-term planning. Um, when you have long-term planning, when you have a long-term vision of the future, decision-making can actually be based on something. It can be based on a strategy. It can be based on some sort of principled, reasoned decision-making. Okay? Um, you can balance that with flexibility and responsiveness, but if your program is completely based on flexibility and responsiveness, it's very easy to lose your sense of direction. It's very easy to just not know where you're going with your program. Um, related to this is the issue of long-term budgeting. Um, I have seen so many EMI programs that were based on short-term grant funding. And I sort of, we've got money from the government for five years, mm -hmm. let's spend it on EMI. Mm -hmm. um, helpful in the short term, it's great, but short-term programs tend to have a lack of buy-in from <coughs> and from admin staff because they know the program is going to disappear in a few years. Also, you end up with a lot of logistical issues when the grant money runs out. People who are hired using grant money, their jobs disappear, their contracts end, they can't continue, the classes they were teaching disappear, the support that the admin people were providing disappear. Uh, but more than the logistical issues, I've also seen a lot of examples where things like attention, positioning, and prestige all change when the grant money runs out. So um, one example of a university that will remain nameless, we'll just call it a semi-large... You see half minutes. Okay. We'll call it a semi-large national university. Um, their key stakeholder for the EMI program was one of the vice presidents of the university. He was involved in every aspect of decision making for the, for the EMI program. The grant money ran out on March 31st. On April 1st, he stopped coming to meetings. They never saw him again. And it wasn't just because the money wasn't there anymore, but because the money wasn't there anymore, the program wasn't important to anyone. And so the key stakeholders disappeared and their attention went somewhere else. However, they were still formally in charge of making all the decisions. So there was no one there who was allowed to make decisions because the key people's attention left the building when the money left. Um, so as a key step for success, long-term planning and long-term budgeting, both very Another aspect is integration. Um, as I said before, a lot of EMI programs in Japan tend to be intro to A, intro to B, intro to C. So students don't get an experience that leads anywhere. They don't get a feeling that the EMI program is helping them accomplish any goals that are attached to or connected to what they want to be studying. So connections between the EMI program and the J Japanese medium instruction program are very important. <coughs> Um, two models that I've seen being very successful are where the English medium instruction program is seen as a supplement to what the students study. So the students are studying economics, and as a supplement to that, they're learning about, let's say, cross-cultural understanding, so that they're able to work internationally. Or as a complement also works. So they take 30% of their economics credits in English, 70% in Japanese, and those complement each other. Both of those work. But wide, shallow programs that are not connected in any real way and don't have any internal coherence don't really work. So as part of the long-term planning, I would advise um, really looking at how EMI and JMI are fitting together and what is the internal coherence of the EMI program. Um, HR issues. EMI programs, well, any program really, they tend to have a lot of problems when faculty members are volunteered to take on classes and when they are uncompensated. Here in Japan, there's sort of a unique pattern where EMI classes are assigned to faculty members above and beyond their regular Japanese medium workload. 
So they already teach seven classes a week in Japanese, and rather than losing one of those to take on an EMI class, the EMI class becomes their eighth class per week. Um, this is not a recipe for motivation for faculty members. Um, you also have problems when too many people are hired on short-term or part-time contracts. When the EMI faculty members are marginalized or tokenized, that's also an issue. And when they're teaching out of field. Um, teaching out of field, uh, there was an interesting study done a few years ago by Bernie Susser. And he looked at the flagship programs at the top tier universities. And he found very few examples of teachers working outside their field of expertise. But he only looked at flagship programs, top tier universities. I know anecdotally, at second or third tier universities, teaching out of field happens all the time. And it's a bit of a problem. So for HR issues, I think it goes back to that idea of long-term planning and long-term budgeting. That's really one of the keys to success for EMI. So what do we need for success in EMI programs? Well, I think um, from my own experience, and I, and I put myself in this group, for a long time, EMI implementers and the EMI researchers have been focused too much on what makes EMI special. And I think we need to remember what makes EMI special, but we are, we're never going to succeed if that's all we ever look at. I think we also need to shift our focus a little bit to look a little bit more about the factors for success in EMI as a program, not in terms of what makes EMI special. Um, I'm not usually a big fan of ending a presentation with a full paragraph on a slide, but I decided for today I really want to make this point as clearly as I can. So planning and implementing an EMI program will hold up a mirror to your institution. If you go into the process with communication and planning issues, there's nothing about making an international program that's going to magically solve your problems. In fact, they're just going to get worse. Okay? But if you go into program development with your eyes open, with a shared sense of understanding and a commitment to long-term planning, all of those unique challenges of EMI that I talked about, they're very, very surmountable obstacles. There's, there's no reason that we can't make those work. But if we don't have those foundational efforts of communication, long-term planning, real strategy, actual policy, if those things are not in place when we start, all of the other <coughs> issues become much, much more. Okay, so uh, uh, if anyone's interested, that QR code will lead to the slides that I've been looking at. Thank you very much.